Hello, everyone, and welcome to an introduction to Evaluation and Management Coding Session. Before we begin, I want to let you know that evaluation and management coding can be pretty complex. There are lots of areas of uncertainty, areas that have not been clarified via the official guidelines. There are differences in how evaluation and management guidelines are interpreted. And so today's session is not meant to cover every aspect of evaluation and management for every region or locality in the United States. I want to let you know that I am based in the Chicagoland area, and so some of the rules that I present today may vary from your part of the country. Also, today's session is not meant to be a consultation. Please refer to your specific payer for guidelines regarding evaluation and management coding. So today, we're going to focus on the basics. So to begin, you'll want to have your 2019 or 2018, that's fine, CPT coding manual with you. And you'll want to ensure that you are at the very beginning of the evaluation and management section where the guidelines are. And you'll know that you are in the correct place in your CPT manual because it will say evaluation and management services guidelines. I highly recommend that you review those guidelines as they will prove to be very helpful in developing a basic understanding of evaluation and management services. Additionally, in our industry today, to accompany and support the guidelines that are housed in the CPT manual, we also have the 1995 and 1997 Evaluation and Management Guide from CMS. Of note, in day-to-day -day practice, a provider can utilize the 1995 or 1997 guidelines based on their specific practice policies. If your practice does not have an evaluation and management services guideline policy for consistency in code selection and application of coding practices, I highly recommend that you create one. All right, so let's begin. Whenever we talk about evaluation and management services, you're going to hear the term components, key components. Well, according to the CPT manual, there are actually seven components to a potential CPT code. Three of the seven components are known as history, exam, and medical decision making. And those three key components will actually be the focus of our session today. However, when it applies, a provider can also use the other four components, which are known as contributing factors, when they contribute to the evaluation and management service that is being performed on today. Now, some of our evaluation and management codes are not based on key components. Rather, they are based on other characteristics, such as discharge services, which have a primary division of time. Another example could be your critical care services, which are not only based on time, but have other characteristics that must be considered. Our 
preventive medicine services codes, which are based upon whether the patient is new or the patient is established, and whether or not the patient falls into a particular age category. So remember I mentioned um, having the CPT manual and reviewing the guidelines that appear at the beginning of the manual? You will also want to make sure that you review the subsection notes that appear in front of a particular family of codes. All right, so what's the bottom line? The bottom line is that you need to ensure that you review the guidelines in front of the evaluation and management services, and then all of the guidelines, subsection notes that appear throughout the evaluation and management service. All right, so whenever I introduce evaluation and management services coding, I always like to refer to my process as having five steps. So step number one requires me to determine what range of codes I am going to be using for the encounter that I'm going to assign a code for today. So I need to consider the type of service. Is this a consultation? Is it an office visit? Is it a hospital visit? Is it an emergency department visit? So place of service. I also need to consider the patient status. Are they a new patient? Are they an established patient? So in your CPT manual, there is some instruction, some guidance on what's considered a new patient versus an established patient. So the one rule that you'll need to remember is, has the patient received any professional services from the physician or qualified healthcare professional or another qualified healthcare professional or physician in the same group of specialty within the past three years? If the answer is yes, then the next question that you have to ask yourself, is it the exact same specialty, okay? And there's a flow chart in your CPT manual that I highly recommend that you become friends with because it most certainly will help you with your decision-making process. So when I say determine the range of codes, this is saying I need to know, am I coding an emergency room visit today? which falls in the range of 99281 to 99285? Am I coding an initial hospital care visit, 99221 to 99223? In your CPT manual, in the back of the manual, you will find an index. Using your index, you can use the type of service, the place of service, or patient status to locate the range of codes for the encounter that you're going to code today. Additionally, in the professional edition of the CPT manual, you can also go to the table of contents for the evaluation and management services area to locate the range of codes for the service that you are coding on today. So that's step number one. All right. So step number two is to determine the extent of the history that was obtained by your provider on today. From a CPT coding perspective, our histories can be divided into four levels, problem focus, expanded problem focus, detailed or comprehensive. Now, in the real world, the provider is not going to state that they did a problem-focused history or an expanded problem-focused history. Instead, the provider is going to document what are known as the four elements of the history, which are the chief complaint, history of present illness, 
review of systems, and past family social history. Keep in mind that the chief complaint has to be documented, but these other areas may not be documented for each and every encounter. Every service that is documented must be medically necessary for the reason for the patient's encounter on today. So let's spend some time looking at the four elements of the history and then explore how we turn them into a history level. And what's our history levels again? Problem focus, expanded problem focus, detailed and comprehensive. So the chief complaint is the reason why the patient is seeing the provider today. Generally, the chief complaint is expressed in the provider's own words, or I'm sorry, the patient's own words. So it is the patient saying why they are visiting our facility or the provider today. Every encounter must have a chief complaint documented. Of note, it is not acceptable to use the words follow-up for your chief complaint. The chief complaint can be something like follow-up for diabetes, follow-up from hospital visit, follow-up from the ED visit. Patient is new to the practice today to establish care. Patient is here to follow up from their last visit where they had um, labs done. In some offices, it is the medical assistant that is actually documenting the chief complaint. So one of the things that I recommend is training our medical assistants to capture a clear and concise statement from the patient about why they are there today. Now, it is the provider's ultimate responsibility to ensure that that chief complaint is stated or can be easily inferred. All right, next up, we're gonna go to the history of the present illness. Per the AMA CPT manual, the history of present illness is a chronological description of the development of the patient's illness from the first sign and or symptom to present. In your CPT manual, we are given a total of seven history of present illness. Those are location, duration, I'm sorry, location, quality, severity, timing, context, modifying factors, associated signs and symptoms. It is the CMS, Evaluation and Management Services Guidelines, that gives us the eighth element of duration. I encourage you to become familiar with the different characteristics of these eight elements. All right, so now we want to look at how we quantify the HPI when we're reading providers' documentation, okay? So from a quantification perspective, from a coding perspective, the history of present illness is documented as either brief or extended. Brief means that the provider has described one to three HPI elements. Remember, there are a total of eight. So the provider describes one to three elements of the HPI. In an extended HPI, the provider describes four or more elements of the HPI. Now, for my new coders out there, I want to be very clear in making sure that you understand that the provider doesn't have to say words like location, abdomen. Um, the duration of the problem is two days. He, can, he or she can simply state 
the patient presents with a four-day history of abdominal pain. You, as the coding specialist, need to be able to um, identify that the location is the abdomen and the duration is three or four days or whatever the provider has stated. Now, this model here is generally referring to a patient that's coming in for what is known as a problem-oriented visit. They're coming in because they're sick um, um, and they have a problem that needs to be um, resolved or cared for or further investigated. So here is an example. The patient complains of sharp pain in the right upper quadrant with nausea since Monday. So we have the duration of the problem. We have the quality of the problem because the provider said that the pain was sharp. We know the location, the right upper quadrant. We know associated signs and symptoms, which are the nausea and the vomiting. And we know that the patient has had this problem since Monday. So let's check your understanding. How many elements of the HPI do I have? So I have duration, quality, location, and associated signs and symptoms. This means that my HPI has been documented as extended because I have four or more. Now, in the 1997 guidelines, we have been instructed that the HPI can also be quantified for situations where the patient is not necessarily sick and they're coming in to follow up on their chronic conditions. So, in the guidelines, they refer to an extended HPI under this model as a situation where the provider documents the status of the three, chronic con three or more chronic conditions when the patient comes in for their um, visit today. So for visual purposes, I have identified for you that if it's less than three chronic conditions, one or two, that is quantified as a brief HPI. So let's check your understanding of this concept. Diabetes controlled by oral medication, extrinsic, asthma without acute exacerbation in the past six months, and hypertension stable with pressures ranging from 130 to 140 over 80 to 90. Here, the provider has stated the status of three chronic conditions, your diabetes, your asthma, and your hypertension. So you have to, if you are using this model, so again, the 1997 guidelines were the first place that this model was established, and some of our payers are saying this is also okay to be used for 1995. So if you're going to, if you are able to use this approach, whenever you're looking at an encounter, you must ask yourself, is this a sick visit or is this a, a patient that's coming in for chronic conditions? Now, let me give you a disclaimer about the use of the status of chronic conditions. Based on my experience, this model can only be used when you have an established patient where the provider is able to document the status of the chronic conditions, the status from the last time that he or she saw the patient. All right, next up, we're going to go on to our next area of the history, which is the review of systems. CPT defines the review of systems as an inventory of body systems obtained through a series of questions seeking to identify 
signs and or symptoms that the patient may be experiencing or has experienced. For purposes of the CPT code set, there are about 14 systems that can be reviewed. The review of systems actually helps the provider define the problem, clarify any differential diagnoses, identify any needed testing that the provider has to request. It can also serve as baseline data on other systems that may be affected by any possible management options. One thing I want my new coders to know is that the provider may not use the word review of systems verbatim. So the question that you may be asking is, how do I know that he or she is actually reviewing the systems? Well, let's say the provider says, patient denies nausea and vomiting. How does the provider know that the patient denies nausea and vomiting? He or she asks the question. So he or she has just completed a gastrointestinal review of systems. The provider can say patient denies shortness of breath. And so in that situation, the provider is performing a cardiovascular, I'm sorry, a respiratory review of systems. With the electronic health record today, you will see where there are nicely formatted areas that say review of systems. But oftentimes, providers perform the review of systems simultaneously with the HPI. And so you may notice that they're intertwined in the HPI. One rule I want you to alert the uh, informed of, the review of systems and HPI must be counted individually, but you can't count something as HPI and then turn around and count it as the review of systems. This is known as double dipping. All right, let's look at an example of a review of systems. No fevers, chills, or blurred vision, no chest pain, no shortness of breath, or belly pain. So how many systems has our provider reviewed? No fever, chills, that's constitutional. Blurred vision, eyes chest pain, cardiovascular, shortness of breath, respiratory, belly pain, gastrointestinal. So to pull this all together, how do we quantify this from a coding perspective? If the provider documents one system that was reviewed, that's known as a problem pertinent review of systems. If the provider reviews two to nine systems, that's known as an extended review of systems. So in that example that I just gave you, let's go back. We had constitutional, eyes, cardio, respiratory, gastro, that's five. So that would be an extended review of systems. Then the third type that we have is known as a complete review of systems. And a complete review of systems has two options. Option number one, the provider can individually document 10 or more systems. Or he or she can document their positive and pertinent negatives. So it should be clearly stated that they've performed the complete review of systems. So they could say something like, all other systems were reviewed and were negative. But notice the statement of all 
other systems were reviewed. So what this means is I have reviewed XYZ systems, which are clearly documented in terms of positive and negative, and then all of the other systems I reviewed were negative. In absence of that statement, the provider must individually document 10 systems in order to have a complete review of systems. So let's look at an example. No fever, chills, or blurred vision, no chest pain, shortness of breath, or belly pain, all other systems reviewed and are negative. All right, the last part of the history is past social family history. Us experienced coders, we refer to this as the PFISH, the past family and social history. So the PFISH, past history, information about the past history pertinent to today's encounter. Social history, such as drinking, smoking, uh, marital status, educational background, and family history. Now, the one thing about these three areas is when the provider is seeing the patient for the first time, you're going to expect to see one or more of these three items documented because they don't know the patient and they want to establish baseline about their patient. But when they come back for an established visit, you don't expect to see a full discussion of all of these items, but only those items, past family social history, that are pertinent and medically necessary for today's encounter. All right? So, from a coding perspective, quantifying this, and don't worry, we're going to pull it all together. From a coding perspective, there are two types of PFISH. There's pertinent, where the provider documents at least one item from the three history areas. The three history areas are what? Past history, family history, and social history. So one of those three. Complete, however, has a little funky rule that you need to be familiar with. So, in some settings, a complete past family social history requires that the provider document two of the three past family social items. But in other settings, the provider has to document three of the three areas. Now, you may be wondering, well, how do I know? Well, remember those evaluation and management guidelines that we spoke of earlier um, from CMS, the 1995 and the 1997? In those guidelines, they have identified in which settings two of the three meet the requirements for a complete PFISH as opposed to other settings where we need all three. Now, remember I said that there are lots of rules regarding evaluation and management services, and this is one of the main reasons why one must have a policy regarding evaluation and management services. All right, so let's check our understanding here. So we have a scenario where we have past history listed, but then they jump right into social history and talk about the mother and the father and they live with their children, uh, li live with three other children, and how um, no medication since Pepto-Bismol, no allergies, immunizations are up to date. So essentially, you have the past history documented and you have the social history documented. Whether this would be considered complete or pertinent would 
depend on what setting our patient is being seen in. Remember this? Some settings, two of the three history areas, qualify for a complete PFISH. And then these other areas, you need all three if you want to quantify a complete past family social history. All right, so pulling all of this together to essentially take us back to the very beginning, which was trying to make a decision as to whether or not my patient's history level was problem focused, expanded problem focus, detailed, or comprehensive. Now, at this point, I want you to pause the recording and I want you to very carefully examine what must be documented for each level. All right, so the first thing that you should notice is that a patient that has a problem focused history does not have a review of systems documented. The next thing you should notice is that the only difference between problem focus and expanded problem focus is that we now have a problem pertinent review of systems. So, in terms of quantifying your documentation to come up with the history level, for the two lower levels, the review of systems is the only difference because they both have brief HPI. Now, let's transition to detail. Let's see what has changed. First, you must have four or more review of systems. You must have two to nine review of systems. So four or more HPI, two to nine review of systems, and then one PFISH. So you may be wondering, well, what happens if my provider has one PFISH, they have two to nine review of systems, but only three HPI? In that case, you have to drop down to expanded problem focus because you have not met the requirements for that level. You must have everything in that level in order to use that level. It's okay if you have more, but at a minimum, in order to have a detailed history, you must have at least four HPI, you must have two to nine review of systems, and one PFISH. And so finally, we're now looking at comprehensive. So comprehensive, which is the highest of the history levels, requires four HPI. Uh-oh, let's pause. What do you notice? Detailed and comprehensive, the two higher levels, both require four or more HPI. Review a system under comprehensive. How it compares to detailed is that you need 10 or more. And then lastly, complete past family social history, you need two or three, and I know you remember, it's two or three of those elements of PFISH based on what setting you're seeing the patient in. All right, step number three. Step number three is determining the exam level. Just like the history, exam level has four types, problem focus, expanded problem focus, detailed, or comprehensive. Now, let me give a disclaimer regarding the exam. The exam is going to differ based upon whether you're using the 1995 guidelines or the 1997 guidelines. With the 
exam in your CPT manual, the CPT manual describes the exam as either a body area, which could be head, including the face, neck, chest, including the breast and axilla, abdomen, genitalia, groin, buttocks, back, and each extremity. But then they also identify the exam as examination of organ systems. CPT recognizes eyes as one, ear, nose, mouth, and throat as another, followed by cardiovascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, genital urinary, musculoskeletal, skin, neurologic, psychiatric, hematologic, lymphatic, and immunologic. In the CPT manual, they give us some ways to recognize these four types of exams. So they say that a problem-focused exam is a limited exam of the affected body area or organ system. Expanded problem focus, they recognize as a limited examination of the affected body area or organ system and other symptomatic or related organ systems. Detailed as an extended examination of the affected body area and other symptomatic or related organ systems. And then comprehensive as a complete or a, uh, let's see, complete examination of a single organ system or a general multi-system examination. So I mentioned to you before that um, there's lots of gray areas um, for um, evaluation and management coding, and this happens to be one of them. So in some parts of the country, and I, I mentioned earlier that I'm in the Chicagoland area, we have established a numerical value <laughs> to the CPT definition. So we define a problem-focused exam as one body area or organ system. This matches the CPT manual, which says a limited exam of the affected body area or organ system. That's easy, right? All right. Expanded problem focus and detailed is where it gets tricky. So in your CPT manual, one distinct characteristic in those definitions is the word limited, which is found in expanded problem focus, versus extended, which is found in detailed. Okay? So every organization has to have a policy in place as to how they handle this. Some schools of thought say, we're gonna do a very clean quantification process. Two to four body areas or organ systems is expanded problem focus. Five to seven body areas or organ systems is detailed, all right? Now, some organizations say both expanded problem focus and detail involve two to seven body areas or organ systems. But in expanded problem focus, it's two to seven and it's very limited. Detail, two to seven, but extended. Now do you see why you need a coding policy? Absolutely. All right, and then comprehensive is very simple like uh, problem focus in that 
there are eight or more organ systems for a comprehensive exam, notice the word organ system. So for a comprehensive exam must be eight or more organ systems or a complete single organ system exam. I know, confusing, right? So you have to decide which model you're going to use and stick with it. All right. So I mentioned about the 1997 Evaluation and Management Guidelines. And so one of the things that I encourage you to do is to explore the Evaluation and Management Guideline um, packet from CMS to develop an understanding regarding the differences between the two sets of guidelines. The most um, prevalent difference really lies in the portion that addresses the examination. In the 1997 guidelines, there is um, greater specificity and variety in the types of exams. Because the 1997 guidelines were really developed as an enhancement to the 1995 guidelines. Now, I know many of you may be thinking, uh, why do we have 95 and why do we have 97? And why is it 2019 and these are still what we have? Because this is what we have today. There are some uh, plans in, in the works to uh, perhaps um, kind of revise this, but this is what we have today, okay? So in your 1997 exam um, guidelines, you actually have specialty exam options. And those specialty exam options can be for a cardiology practice, dermatology, ears, nose, and throat, um, your ophthalmologist, your genital urinary female, genital urinary male, um, for a hematologist, lymphatic, infectious disease provider, um, there's musculoskeletal, there's neurology, there's psychiatry, there's respiratory. And so if you are coding for a specialist, these or this exam format may be more advantageous to your provider. Now, 1997 also has what's known as a general multi-system exam, which to some extent reminds me of um, the 95 guidelines. So that's one big major enhancement. And then the other enhancement was something that I spoke about earlier, which was related to the status of the chronic conditions and the HPI. And let me just remind you again, you want to check with your payer to see if that rule can be used in 1995 world in addition to 1997. So in those different specialty examination templates that CMS provided us with, they've divided the exam into these different bullets, okay? And I'm gonna share that um, approach with you shortly, but let's look at numerically <laughs> how it applies. So problem focus exam is when the provider has documented an exam that is represented by these bullets that are in those exam templates. Now, I know you're wondering, what the heck is she talking about bullets? You must go and grab the Evaluation and Management Services Guidelines and specifically look 
at the exam templates because that's where you'll see what I mean by bullets. And it was my goal for this to just be a one-hour session, and I could see that this is going to be, right now I'm probably at about 45 minutes. And so I want to um, equip you with the tools that you need to um, consider, but also recognizing that you're going to have to do some additional uh, research, all right? So the different exam templates have these bullets. So for example, under general multi-system, there is an area called constitutional. And sidebar, in your CPT manual, under organ systems that are recognized, the CPT manual does not identify a constitutional organ system. However, the 1995 guidelines specifically says from an exam perspective, constitutional exam are the vital signs. So the provider can get credit for those vital signs that were actually performed on today. Okay, so you got to look at those guidelines for those bullets. So one to five bullets, problem focus, example, constitutional. General appearance is one bullet. Vital signs, if there are three of the seven vital signs measured, must be three, then you have another bullet, okay? So then when you get to expanded problem focus, then you transition into six to 11 bullets. Now, detailed and comprehensive is where it gets more complex. And I'm going to, in the interest of time, refer you to going back or going to those guideline uh, templates so that you can see very clearly about detailed versus comprehensive. So what I'll tell you just, just in parting from this section, that detailed says that you are looking at bullets from six or more organ systems or 12 bullets from two or more organ systems but then with some exam templates, I and psych, you need nine plus bullets. All others, you need 12 plus for detail. You see why I said you got to go to the exam templates and actually lay eyes on them because it can be pretty complex. And with that said, I'm going to move on. So here's an exam. And if we looked at this from a 1995 perspective, General, no acute distress, vital signs, one organ system, which is constitutional. Now, next, head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat. I will tell you as a documentation specialist, when I am looking at an abbreviation that says H-E-E-N-T, I don't quantify that exam until I see something documented about the head. In this particular case, normal cephalic. Eyes. Here they say anti sclera. Again, so now, oh, head, that's a body area. Eyes, organ system. Now, the next part of that abbreviation is ears, nose, and throat. And I don't see that that was documented. And so for me, as a documentation specialist, I personally would not give a provider credit for eyes, I'm sorry, for ears, nose, mouth, and throat, because I don't see that documented, okay? So then um, I would go to neck, which is a body area. Then I have lungs. Then I have heart. Then I have abdomen. So let's talk a little bit about abdomen. So with the um, implementation of electronic health records, a lot of times I see abdomen, the word abdomen, but then when I read directly behind abdomen, I see words like soft, non-tender, and no masses. Now, if you look at your CPT manual for body area, 
you see abdomen. And for organ systems, you see gastrointestinal. So as a documentation specialist, when I'm looking at the word abdomen, I am trying to determine, am I only going to be able to count abdomen and or gastrointestinal? So for soft and non-tender, I'm going to give credit for abdomen, but for no masses, I'm going to give credit for um, gastrointestinal. This is another gray area that I recommend in your own organizational policy that you clarify. After that, we have extremities, neuro, breasts, and the lymph nodes. So from a quantification perspective, you have to go through here and count them all up, okay? And, and, and this is where it gets um, somewhat tricky if you don't have a policy that drives how you are um, applying the guidelines, 97 versus 95. Also, when we have electronic health records, sometimes they, we think they're, that the system is counting it based on 95 when actuality is calculating it based on 97. So this is why it's important for you to really truly identify. So we have constitutional, so that's one organ system. We have uh, eyes, that's two. I'm going to skip around a little bit. We have lungs, that's three, that's respiratory. We have heart, that's four, that's cardiovascular. I said I was going to count masses as GI, so that's five. We have neuro, which is six. Now, we also have um, lymph nodes, so that can be counted um, under lymphatic. So now that's seven. So the million-dollar question is, do I have eight organ systems to then arrive at a comprehensive exam? So you see where it says um, breast. And so some coders, auditors, documentation specialists would say, okay, I'm going to count that as chest because chest says including breast and axilla. And as I'm looking at this documentation, they're definitely talking about the breast and um, there is no significant um, bruising, et cetera. But they also say no skin changes. And so as a documentation specialist, I would also give the provider credit for integumentary, which is an organ system called skin, which then gives me a comprehensive exam. Again, evaluation and management, has a lot of gray areas, and can be pretty subjective. All right, um, here, another version of a physical exam documented. Um, here, you don't have a lot of templated information, so to speak. So you have head is normal cephalic. That's a body area. Pupils are equal round and react to light accommodation. All right, that's eyes. So as you can see, your goal is to read through the documentation and then quantify the exam level. Step number four probably is the most complex of them all, which is medical decision making. According to the CPT manual, medical decision making refers to the complexity of establishing a diagnosis and or selecting a management option and is measured by three areas. Number one, the number of diagnoses or treatment options. Two, the amount and or complexity of the data that the provider has to review. And then three, the risk of complication, and or morbidity, which is disease, or death, which is mortality, which is essentially how sick the patient is. So let's tackle one at a time, starting with number of diagnoses and treatment options. The CPT manual uses the word number of diagnoses and management options. Management options, treatment options is the same, potato, patata, right? Okay, 
So here's another area where different regions have quantified, um, have tried to quantify this process because it can be pretty complex. So this table represents diagnoses into three categories, self-limited, minor problem, such as like a code, established problem that is stable versus worsening, new problem, no additional workup plan, new problem, additional workup plan. As it relates to this table, our goal is to really just get to a numerical value of four points. So after you get to four points, you could essentially stop counting. In your CPT manual, in the evaluation and management guidelines, there is a table one that's called the complexity of medical decision making. And under the column that says number of diagnoses or management options, you see something that says minimal, limited, multiple, and then extensive. So in my personal CPT manual, I've put some numerical values to those areas. So first column, number of diagnoses or management options, I say minimal, that's one diagnosis. Limited, that's two. Multiple, that's three. Extensive, that's four. Let me pause and ensure that you understand what I mean. I'm not referring to one, two, three, or four diagnoses. I'm referring to one, two, three, or four points. Why? Because this table here, I just told you that once you get to four points, you can stop counting. And that has a direct correlation to table one in your CPT manual, where I've just identified that minimal one point, limited two points, multiple three points, extensive four points. So let's look at a real live scenario to just kind of get our eyes, our heads around that. All right, here you have a patient that has acute exacerbations chronic diastolic congestive heart failure, severe pulmonary hypertension. Severe pulmonary hypertension, <laughs> documented again. Um, severe mitral regurgitation, questionable nursing home um, acquired pneumonia, acute on chronic renal insufficiency, coronary artery disease, history of AFib, history of seizure disorder. Now, don't overthink this. Don't overthink this. You got at least five or six diagnoses. No matter how you swing this, it's four points. Why? You got four diagnoses. If you said new problem, additional workup plan, yeah, you could say four problems, four points, four times four is 16. You don't need to do that. Why? Four points total. Done. Okay? So what if you only had two problems? Same concept. Are they new problems? Are they established problems? Assign the points based upon established problems, stable, established problem, worsening. Established problem, stable, one point. Established problem, worsening, two points. New problem, no additional workup. We can only have one new problem from a quantification perspective with a maximum of three points. So one new problem, no additional workup, three points, times one problem gives you three points. New problem, additional workup plan. Um, in this model, they don't say that you can't have more than one um, new problem with additional workup plan, but one new problem with additional workup plan equals four points. You only need to get to four points so you can, yes, you've guessed it, stop. All right. The next portion of this area is the amount and or complexity of data that is to be reviewed. So let me just say again, this is another area where in some parts of the country, 
this portion is quantified differently. You must know how you are to quantify based upon the region that you're working in. All right, so how this works is you review your medical record documentation, and if your provider is reviewing and or ordering a radiology section test, one point. Review and or order pathology section test, one point. Review and or order medicine section test, one point. If they discuss the test results with a performing physician, one point. Oh, tip here, four points is the maximum. Let's tie this back to, let's pause for a second, tie this back to table one in your CPT manual, complexity of medical decision making. Notice it says minimal or none. So that's zero to one. Point. Limited, two, multiple, three, extensive, four. Now, I want you to know that all of these data points that I'm mentioning here, these are not going to be documented in every patient encounter. It's all about what's medically necessary for that encounter. So I don't want you as a new coder to say, well, wait, I can't give them a one point for the pathology section because they didn't review or order that particular test today. It's okay because you are only going to focus on what was actually documenting. You're quantifying this information based on what's documented and based on medical necessity. Okay, so you can pause the recording, look at these other areas. See how we get one point for a decision to obtain the other record, um, to obtain the records. And so, again, take it step by step. This is a very complex process. All right, check your understanding. So, provider says they had a long discussion with the patient's son. DNR status was con uh, confirmed. They're going to add um, blood. Okay, so we get one point for blood. Now. Notice, you notice it says, we will add to blood and lab a dilatin, a dilantin level, cardiac enzymes, troponin, magnesium, and a D-dimmer. So you may be wondering, oh, okay, review and or order of radiology section test, pathology section test, medicine section test. Since I just saw like four pathology tests, do I get one point? No. I'm sorry, do I get one point for each blood test? No, I'm sorry. If they order or review 10 pathology section tests, you still only get one point. They could have a CT scan and an MRI that's still one point from the radiology section. Okay, so let's go back to our, our example. So let's see what else they got. They got, um, they're going to change the diet. They're going to recheck the labs. They're going to check their I's and O's. Um, the patient doesn't want a Foley. They want the patient weighed daily. They're giving them Lasix, IV push, uh, Cartizem. They're going to hold for blood pressure, on and on and on. They're going to get a chest X-ray in the morning. So here you got blood test, one point. Chest X-ray, one point. And again, the maximum points you can get is four. And so you have to read through your documentation and make a decision as to how many points you actually have. And so something I should mention to you guys with all of this whole quantification process, don't overthink it. But also, I have to tell you that it's important for you to know that evaluation and management is not learned overnight, okay? It is definitely something that um, you have to see more than once. And in a day-to-day -day practice setting, you must have a policy. And if you are looking for some assistance with creating your policy, I am available on a contract basis to assist with the development of your policy, because having a policy in place is, is like golden, 
All right? All right, so next we're going to talk about, oh, the probably the most complex, the most confusing part, which is the third um, measurement for determining the complexity of medical decision making, which is the risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality, which is this table of risk. So as it relates to the table of risk, I want you to note that there are three columns. Well, there are actually four columns, so let's start with the first column. The level of risk is either minimal, low, moderate, or high. And I'll just give you a sidebar. In your CPT manual, I'm, I don't have any numbers or numerical values for you to add to this, so pay close attention. So the level of risk is either minimal, low, moderate, or high. Across from the level of risk, you see three columns, presenting problem, diagnostic procedure ordered, and then the management option selected. So what you have to do is go through your record, your encounter, and really like a tic-tac-toe game, identify in these three columns what your provider is actually doing today. And here's where it gets tricky. To qualify for a certain level of risk, we actually look at the highest level of risk based on these three tables. And I know you're thinking, okay, what does that mean? So let's say we are talking about that patient that we saw earlier. And that patient that we saw earlier, um, one of the management options that was identified was do not resuscitate. So if you look at the a column that says management option selected, and you look at the bottom box where it says decision not to resuscitate, notice that when you go back to the first column, which is the level of risk, that's high. So guess what? That's as high as you can go. So your risk of complications, morbidity, or mortality for this patient is high. Okay, let's do another example. Let's say you have a patient that comes in with an acute, uncomplicated illness or injury, and that's their presenting problem. So you're looking at the first, the second column, presenting problem, and notice that an acute, uncomplicated illness or injury is classified as a low level of risk. So at this point, you need to see if for the other two columns, based upon diagnostic procedure ordered or management option selected, is either of those columns going to be moderate or high? If not, you're stuck at low. So let's say that the provider for this acute, uncomplicated illness or injury, as a management option, prescribes prescription drugs. That is moderate. So the moderate now trumps the low. And so unless you can get to high based upon the diagnostic procedure order, your level of risk is moderate for that patient. So let's look at our patient that we just finished. And um, we can clearly see with the DNR status that this patient's risk is most certainly high. All right, okay. I told you this area was complex, but this, my friends, is the table that is in your CPT manual, table one. So notice that there are four 
types of decision making. Oh, remember earlier I talked about the three key components, history, exam, medical decision making? Well, there are four types of medical decision making, straightforward, low, moderate, or high. Now, remember I had you write in your CPT manual under diagnosis or management options that minimal was one point, limited, two points, multiple, three points, extensive four points, remember that? And then for the data, I said minimal or none, zero to one point, limited, two points, moderate, three points, extensive, four points. This is where all of that is going to come into play. And then the risk, you know that that's referring to the table of risk that I just showed you a few minutes ago. So one of the things I will tell you is that new coders often find this area to be quite, quite confusing. And so one of the things I recommend that you do is, is really kind of use a, a highlighter or something to, and a, at a table like this to figure out your medical decision making. So let me throw in one more rule. To qualify for a given type of medical decision making, what are our types of medical decision making? Straightforward, low, moderate, or high. So to qualify for a given type of medical decision making, two of the three elements in this particular table have to be met or exceeded. Now I know you're thinking, what the heck does that mean? So I'm glad you asked. So I want you to um, I want you to consider um, the patient who we just finished um, we just finished working with. So remember that patient had all of those problems, and we said that their number of diagnoses was extensive. Okay, so I'm going to circle extensive right here. So extensive essentially includes multiple, right, because that's lower, limited, and minimal. Two of the three elements in table one must be met or exceeded to qualify for a type of medical decision making. Just real quick, let's skip over to our risk. We said our risk was high, remember? So high also includes the lower levels. So the million dollar question is, in which two columns, number of diagnoses and management options, data, oh, and let's fill in our data. They had a uh, blood work and some x-ray. Okay. In which two columns going across straightforward, low complexity, moderate complexity, highest complexity, do you have two or more items selected? And the answer is high, right? Because you have extensive under number of diagnosis and management options, and you have high under uh, the risk. Now, I know you may be wondering, okay, that, that seems pretty easy, maybe. This definitely takes some time to get used to. So can you give me another example? Absolutely. So I'm going to use a different color. So let's say you had that patient who had the um, 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 acute sprain, okay? According to the presenting problem table, um, that's an area um, that was classified as a low risk, right? And then also remember, we said that that patient would potentially get um, a prescription drug management. Oh, so let me just go back here to that table because I want to make sure you, you understand. So example I was trying to illustrate, the patient that had the acute uncomplicated illness or injury, right? So that, that puts us right here in our table. 
And then I said, if they have prescription drug management, that puts them over here under management options selected. And of these three columns, I have the highest circle in moderate. So my risk is moderate. So let's say, go back to this table, that my new patient, and I'm going to do a different color, has moderate risk, okay? So I'm just, I want you to see moderate risk. So I'm going to move away high. Let me move away all of these. Okay, so now the risk is, this is my new patient, moderate. Now, this is, I mentioned, um, the patient that they have this new problem. It's acute, uncomplicated. So new problem. And let's say there's no additional workup plan. In the first column, what did I tell you that was? Three points. Now, you're like, wait, what are you talking about? Remember when we were over here? New problem. No additional workup plan is three points. So here, I can't draw very well. That's three points, okay? So I'm essentially bringing this over to this area here. So that's three points. And then let's say that there is no data, okay? So that's here. So what is the type of medical decision making. It is moderate because I have two columns where I meet the requirements for moderate. Now, I know you're thinking, okay, I still don't get it. And it's okay because I know this is the most complex. I'm going to use a different color for my last example. And let's say that my patient's problem is self-limited or minor. So for number of diagnoses or management options, that is minimal, okay? And let's say in terms of data, my doctor ordered uh, blood work, one point from the pathology section, and ordered an x-ray. Well, then that's two points, so now I'm here. Then let's say that he gave them a prescription drug. Well, according to the table of risk, that's moderate. So now you are probably saying, okay, crazy lady, how do I then determine what my type of medical decision making is? If you're like me, you have to get visual with this. CPT manual says to qualify for a given type of medical decision making, Two of the three elements in this table must be met or exceeded. I'm visual, so I got to see, I got to bubble in my lower levels here. And so I can see which two columns do I have two bubbles? Well, across from low, I have my data bubble and I have my risk bubble. I got two, so I'm going to go with low. Why couldn't I go with um, high? Because I only had one bubble. All right, guys, enough of those bubbles. Step number five is pulling it all together. You take your history, you take your exam, and your medical decision-making, and you arrive at your final code. As you read your CPT manual, you will discover that in some code families, such as a new patient, the code level that you select has to be based on three components. Those three components are what? History, exam, and medical decision making. But in other areas, such as your established patient, you only need two of the three components. You know we have to have an example. So let's apply the five steps that we have discussed. Step one was to determine the range of codes. And we said we determine the range of codes by 
deciding our type of service, place of service, and patient status. So I see that my patient is a new patient in the office, right? My patient is a new patient in the office. For a new patient in the office, the range of codes is 99201 to 99205. Now, for this example, I've already gone through my documentation and I have determined that my patient's history was comprehensive, their exam was detailed, and the medical decision making is high. So I begin to explore 99201 and 99202 and 203 and 204 and 205, and I'm like, okay, well, Comprehensive is in 99204 and 99205, but then detail is in 99203, but then high complexity medical decision making is in 99205, and I'm just like really confused as to which way I should go. So let me give you a visual. Remember earlier I was talking about um, quantifying all of the different uh, levels from the perspective of the history, the exam, and the medical decision making? So let's take all of that and plot it into this diagram that I've created. So notice that I mentioned that our patient had a comprehensive history. Okay, so that's here. But then that's also here. Now, I said my patient had a detailed exam. That's here and also here. And then I said my medical decision making was high. Now, this is a new patient in the office. And according to the CPT manual, for a new patient in the office, in order to select a code, I must meet or exceed the requirements for that code. So can I use 99205? Why? No. Why? Because I didn't have a comprehensive exam. My exam was detailed. And let's do something else. Remember I said that the higher levels always include the, the lower? So if they did a comprehensive history, that means that includes 99203, 99202, 99201, and if they did a detailed exam, that includes 99202 and 99201, and if they did high decision making, that includes all the lower, lower levels. So, the question that then remains, in which area do I have three X's? And the answer is 99203. So why couldn't I have a 99204 or a 99205? Because of my exam. Again, evaluation and management can be pretty tricky. It does require, it does, it truly does require um, practice, okay? This is just a very brief introduction. So what you just learned about was the concept of 
meeting, or exceeding. And there are lots of different, um, uh, what do I want to say? There are lots of different models that can be used or, or evaluation and management um, tools that you can use to calculate your levels. And if you're first starting out, I recommend that you have a tool that you use so that you can consistently follow the same process. All right, so next I want to talk about very briefly coding based on time because a lot of providers like to code their service based on time. And time is one of those contributing factors. And remember, time can contribute to the encounter for today. But in order to code based on time, and we're going to end our discussion today on this, in order to code based on time, you have to answer yes to these three questions. Number one, does the documentation reveal total time of face-to-face -face or unit-to-floor visit? Must answer yes. If you don't, you can stop. You can't code based on time. Does the documentation describe the counseling and coordination of care that was provided? Here's a caveat with this. In addition to the total time, as it relates to the counseling and coordination of care, that counseling and coordination of care must dominate more than 50% of that service today. That's why the total time has to be documented. Then the last question is, um, was that counseling actually documented? Did they describe that service? If you can answer yes to these three questions, you can most certainly bill based on time, but all of these must be documented. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening to my evaluation and management brief introduction. And please subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is Dr. Campbell's Coding Corner. Thank you so much and have a great day.